Thank you all for coming. And I'm going to thank uh, John Hancock from CCIC Coal at the beginning for the drinks and chips. We greatly appreciate it. And before I introduce the speaker, you probably all know, but I will still introduce anyway, I want to introduce a new staff member who's just joined us. Nankoselo Madlakana has just joined us as a new metamorphic petrologist and the team of scientist. So I'm sure you'll each get a chance to, to meet her in the near future. But for today's GeoTalk, we have Professor Judith Kinnaird, who will be speaking about uh, a unifying model for tin mineralization. And as you all probably know, Judith has joined the school in 1999, but before that, did most of her undergrad and postgrad education in the UK, her MSc and PhD at the University of St. Andrews. And that's actually where she first got introduced to African geology, where she worked in Nigeria on mineralization in, in some of the, the ring complexes, in particular the granites. She then taught in the UK and was also an independent consultant in the UK, working on many different African uh, mineral deposits, and as I said, joined the school in 1999, and since then has uh, been an eminent scientist in the school, working on many different research topics, but also leading the field in many different ways, including being a past president of the SEG, as well as a director of AGRI, and currently a co-director of Chimera, for which we're very thankful. So Judith, thank you very much for offering to give this talk, and over to you. Thank you. Um, this talk is part of a series of talks um, that I have to give as a Society of Economic Geologists um, visiting lecturer. It's a bit like a Dutoy lecture, except that um, it's aimed at third and fourth year students um, who are studying economic geology. And uh, I've made it difficult by, for myself by offering five uh, different topics. And so far, everybody seems to have chosen a different topic. So I've got to write five different damn lectures. So the Society of Economic Geologists is uh, 7,000 members strong. It's based in Denver in the uh, US, but it has got members in 100 countries. And there are many branches of student societies of the SEG, including one shared between UJ and uh, WITS, SASEG. So there are several uh, functions off campus this year, and uh, look out for them, including the highlight of the GEA quiz at the end of the year. So I want to um, talk about tin, and specifically in Africa. And I promised um, uh, various people that this is a geochemistry-free um, talk, so I don't know whether that's good or not. Tin. Everybody knows about tin. Tin cans, tin foil, tin whistles, etc. Except tin cans are made from uh, steel or aluminium. Tin foil is made from aluminium. Well, you, you, you kind of get the idea. Um, and the use of tin dates back uh, more than 4,000 years when some enterprising uh, metallurgist found that if you added a little bit to um, uh, copper, it made a much harder, much more malleable, workable uh, material for making um, uh, stone tools. <coughs> and um, so the uh, Greeks highly prized this new bronze, and um, uh, here um, uh, in Greece, they, um, it was very hush-hush where this metal came from. And there was talk in Greece of the Cassiterides, which are supposedly islands off the northwest, uh, in the northwest Atlantic. And almost certainly, the um, tin uh, for Greece came from Cornwall in the UK, or from um, Spain and came to um, Greece um, on the Mediterranean Sea. So important was tin that this led to the Romans he, uh, from here, Rome, uh, um, actually invading the British Isles um, to secure the tin. So um, the use of bronze dates back to uh, 4,000 years ago in this dark area is, um, uh, where it was first used and then lighter areas where it was later used. 
And Paul and I, um, in the previous millennium, worked here in Ross Island and the west of Ireland um, where um, bronze had been used 4,000 years ago. In fact, in what they called the pre-bronze age. Now, how you can have a pre-bronze age, just push the boundaries back. That's what we do in geology, just move the boundaries, but the archaeologists don't. So, question for you, what is the modern use of tin? If I'd asked you a few years ago what tin was used for, you might have come up with the answers of it was used for solder. Um, uh, here's some soldering wire. Or you might have suggested it was used for tin plate for um, uh, coating cans um, to prevent them going rusty. But there's a modern use of tin. And um, I'm going to m make you think what that modern use of tin is. Why is tin now a critical metal? There's a TV program on British TV called Pointless. And it does actually show sometimes on Channel 120 on DSTV. So some of you might have seen it. But the idea of pointless is to come up with the um, answer that fewest people have thought of. So they say that they ask 100 people and they give them 100 seconds to come up with um, a film made by Leonardo DiCaprio or whatever. And you've got to try and think up some unmemorable film that he um, uh, starred in to get the lowest points possible. And the winner gets the lowest, uh, is the one that gets the lowest points. So there's not 100 people here, so you're not going to get 100 seconds. Come on in, Eva. So have you thought what um, is that use that makes tin a critical metal that's strategic for high-tech industries? Well, many of you may have a smartphone in your pocket. And um, the tin, the, the, one of the current uses of tin is as indium tin oxide in this very thin coating um, so that when you press um, on the screen, it activates um, the screen. And the, what does that is this indium tin oxide. I wonder how many of you got that answer. Mm, not a lot of you are looking confident. So let me ask you another question. What are the top six producing countries? Now, I did my PhD uh, on tin-bearing granites in Nigeria, um, again last millennium. And uh, the top six producing countries for tin have changed completely um, since I did my PhD. And the top six producing countries are shown there. And between China, Burma, Indonesia, Brazil, uh, Bolivia, and Peru, um, uh, those six countries produce 90% of the world's tin. And if you look in the um, uh, smaller segments here, you can see um, Democratic Republic of Congo here and um, uh, Nigeria uh, there. So, if tin was first used 4,000 um, years ago and more in the Middle East, I wonder if any of you have an idea of when it was first used in Africa. Although uh, we have um, records of iron and copper being used in southern Africa um, way back to 200, 300 um, AD, there was apparently no tin used or bronze until the 9th century AD. And on the screen there, you can see a map of Nigeria um, with um, the uh, old Precambrian um, uh, basement rocks here, cross-cut by Mesozoic uh, younger granites, and then um, uh, younger uh, Cretaceous sediments in the Niger um, Benue Valley and um, uh, tertiary and quaternary to the northwest and the northeast. But across this basement, um, you can see um, a pegmatite zone that I'll be coming back to, and the location of Igbo Ukwu and the Benin Kingdom. And it was here in the Igbo Ukwu area that um, the first bronzes um, from the 9th century date, and we have the rather beautiful pot here 
and then Benin bronzes, which are world famous um, for their intricacy dating back to the 13th century. Coming to South Africa, bronzes um, have been dated between the um, 13th and 19th century um, uh, in northern part of South Africa into Botswana in Zimbabwe. And uh, tin has been mined from the Royberg area of the bush complex um, dating back over 500 years. So let's, that's the sort of the history of tin. Now let's look into the, um, where tin is in Africa and move on to uh, the unifying model. We've got five major ages of um, tin in Africa, dating from Archean in Swaziland and uh, Zimbabwe, to Paleoproterozoic in the Bushveld in South Africa, to Mesozoic and Pleistocene in places like Nigeria. And we get major eras of tin mineralization, both related to continental amalgamation and continental fragmentation. So we get um, uh, these major era, eras then related to continental amalgamation when we had um, the collision of the cratons here with the eastern part here and again uh, further to the south. And then what goes together came apart again so that in, in the Mesozoic we had uh, magmatism and tin mineralization in this area and this area um, uh, in the um, Mesozoic. And we also get tin provinces. Um, a uranium province or a tin province means um, an area where you get that mineralization, in this case tin, in several periods of time. So we get tin provinces in um, South Africa, in Nigeria, in Namibia, where, and Mozambique, where we get um, peg, uh, tin in pegmatites that are 1,000 million years old and also 500 million years old. And I'm going to be talking about a couple of different areas dotting around Africa, from um, uh, Nigeria to East Africa to Namibia and to um, South Africa. So we're going to look at tin hosted in a variety of different um, uh, geological settings, whether it's pegmatite hosted, whether it's in um, uh, veins, whether it's disseminated, or whether it's alluvial or eluvial. And so I want to propose a model to you where um, everything is kind of linked. So we can have um, pegmatites, which are um, small um, uh, degrees of partial melt, which have migrated from a source um, without a parent um, uh, granite. And then um, to bodies where you've got a lot more magma um, uh, generated, where you get tin mineralization shown in these sort of purpley areas, often in the roof zones, to tin in systems um, that have evolved from those granites. Now, the, the uh, model for pegmatites, pegmatites were not sexy. Um, only about 30 people worldwide have worked on pegmatites for, the, for their, their sort of research life. And a long-held model for pegmatites is that they come from a parent granite, so that they come from something um, uh, shown here in the um, uh, bottom right. And then um, as you go out away from the, um, uh, this granite, um, uh, the pegmatites are supposedly, um, supposed to be a barren close to the um, granite parent and then mineralized at distance. A lot of us who are working on pegmatites are disputing um, th the fact that there must always be a, a granite batholith parent body. And in fact, Axel Muller, one of those people who's working in Europe in uh, Norway, has actually written a paper which is entitled something like Thousands of Pegmatites Without a Granite Parent. I think it's in um, a Canadian Mineralogist. And so um, uh, I 
um, uh, su subscribe to that idea where we can get pegmatites here that are zoned or unzoned, generated from small melt fractions without a parent granite. And um, uh, many of these um, may have cassiterite in them, both formed at the um, uh, magmatic stage and also a second generation from a, a later hydrothermal alteration of the pegmatite. So let me take you to um, some neoproterozoic 500 million year old uh, pegmatites um, occurring in Nigeria, Namibia, and um, uh, Mozambique and elsewhere. There are older pegmatites in um, the Kabaran of Central Africa, and I'll come back to those um, a bit later on. But we had um, collision between East and West Gondwana. We had um, a late um, extension and plutonism. And then we had um, pegmatites forming um, uh, often um, uh, 10, 20 million years or more after the um, uh, plut major plutonism. And um, uh, this Pan-African uh, uh, um, event gave us many important pegmatites, not just for um, tin, but for things like columbite, tantalite, beryl, and, and other gemstones. So going back to this pegmatite zone uh, in Nigeria, um, these are all um, tin-bearing pegmatites, and the tin uh, forms as tin dioxide, cassiterite, and it's often accompanied by columbite or tantalite. And um, there's also a tin mineral called wagenite, which is a tin tantalum uh, mineral. Of similar age um, uh, are the uh, Pan-African pegmatites in Namibia. This is the um, Damara origin, which we've spent um, a, a lot of um, uh, researchers in this department and elsewhere have looked at the, this um, zoned um, origin. And there are a series of um, pegmatite belts um, in um, this western uh, part of Namibia. Some of them are spectacularly zoned. Um, uh, these pictures are taken from Louisa Ashworth's thesis. Some of them have extremely large um, uh, crystals in, and here's some uh, petalite um, crystals and a small um, person for scale. That would be me. And um, uh, this is work from Warwick Fuchslock's PhD thesis, and um, he's shown there a series of these pegmatite belts, and he in particular worked on um, uh, the belt B and C, and these are the ones that are um, uh, tin-bearing. The, um, there is a very good demonstration of the fact that these pegmatites occur very late in the tectonic um, uh, development of the origin. And here you can see um, a pegmatite cutting across um, the, the fabric of the uh, country rocks. And again, another one with uh, Warwick for scale. So these um, uh, pegmatites occur throughout the, um, the Namib Desert. Sometimes they are well exposed um, here, um, uh, uh, going past Warwick to, to me, and sometimes they're much less well exposed, and it's quite a challenge to um, do some work on them. But these um, pegmatites are um, tin-bearing. There's a picture of cassiterite in thin section. And these pegmatites are cutting a, um, a rock called a knotted schist, um, which was, um, uh, uh, these knots were originally uh, cordurite. And you can see some um, of the uh, cassiterite um, in uh, part of this pegmatite at Uis, uh, which is the um, uh, subject of Tim Murray's MSc thesis, which he's just completed. 
Now, um, uh, I mentioned earlier that you might get cassiterite at the magmatic stage, which um, you, you sort of see here, but also you can get alteration of that pegmatite from the very late um, hydrothermal fluid associated with this intrusion, and it alters the original feldspar. It grisonizes it. It changes it to a mixture of um, fine-grained mica and um, quartz and sometimes a little bit of um, topaz. And you see the same sort of thing. We were looking at a Nigeria, pegmatites in, in um, uh, Namibia, and we also see pegmatites in Somaliland where Paul and I have done some work. And I quite like it when your, your pegmatites are so obvious that you can see them from a couple of kilometers away. And these are post-orogenic pegmatites cutting this basement spine um, uh, of um, uh, paleo to neoproterozoic rocks that go across the center of Somaliland, which is here on the um, Gulf of Aden. And um, you get different sorts of pegmatites, and you have to look at the right sort of pegmatite for the um, uh, minerals that you're looking at. There's two different um, sorts, something called a lithium cesium tantalum and uh, something called a niobium yttrium fluorine type. And um, uh, what we're looking at, the pegmatites here in Somaliland, is not so much for cassiterite, although there are a few with cassiterite, but we're trying to find the ones um, that have these beautiful emeralds in for the gemstone miners. So we've been looking at pegmatites without a parent granite. Um, I want to go sort of up now to um, where there's more of an accumulation of uh, magma um, to give you um, granite sheets, blobs, bodies, plutons um, that may um, show um, alteration, uh, particularly in the um, roof zones here. Uh, but if you're looking for tin, not all granites are born equal. If you look at um, a plot of the granitoid uh, clan on a Streckeisen diagram, um, you can see that um, uh, over here, they're more likely to um, uh, be compositionally um, uh, rich in plagioclase and more likely to have copper in them. So we need to come over to um, uh, Monza granites, cyanogranites, and alkali feldspar granites if we want to find tin-bearing granites. And we find tin-bearing granites in um, uh, South Africa. Here's a map of the um, Bushveld granite. Um, these are paleoproterozoic um, granites shown in pink here, the Rustenburg suite shown in green. And you can see a number of different um, uh, tin fields shown, although none is currently worked for tin, although um, the Zyplatz area where Leo von Apartis is doing his um, PhD is being re-looked at. And that's because um, there <coughs> is an um, at... Um, Zyplatz. There's a number of these very rich mineralized pipes, um, which I'll show you in the next picture. But there's also a zone of uh, disseminated mineralization, shown here in a Bushveld Minerals cartoon um, as a zone in red, where um, tin is very much distributed um, uh, in the roof portions of um, the um, Bobby Arncock granite and Lease granite shown here beneath the uh, volcanics of the uh, granifier. And Bushveld Minerals think that there's a high enough grade um, in this uh, zone to be mined. What has been mined in the past is these pipe-like bodies. And everywhere you go, you find these sort of holes here where um, uh, these pipes have been worked. And here you can see um, a, a little, a baby pipe, um, too small to have been mined. Um, and these pipes are very uh, rich in tourmaline, and also um, they are rich in tin. And um, these, these represent um, uh, little um, alteration zones where hydrothermal fluids have separated prior to the ductile brittle um, uh, um, separation. 
And if we go to much younger granites in, in Nigeria, we see exactly the same thing. On the left is a, a map that um, uh, I was involved in making back in uh, the days of my PhD. And um, the rocks um, shown in white are um, uh, Precambrian basement, and these are Mesozoic uh, ring complexes um, stretching from Dudzi up here at 213 million years of age down to Afu uh, on the edge of the Benue Valley, um, which is 141 million years in age. The rocks shown in red are the um, granites, and the rocks shown in green are volcanics, where they haven't been stripped quite um, so much as um, further south, although at Ningi you can see um, a, a little bit of granite poking through their own volcanics. So these are very shallow um, intrusions. And in the next slide, I'm going to um, mention Rirui, um, which is um, here. But um, we can see we can see uh, that sometimes the mineralization is um, disseminated in very patchy alteration, both um, uh, where it's been altered to, by microclinization and gricinization. And um, those, uh, that alteration here was again before the fluid set, um, uh, uh, before the transition from ductile to brittle um, uh, so that the fluids just um, were disseminated through the granite. When um, the rocks um, uh, started to become more brittle, then these veins could develop. And um, in Rirui, um, a five-kilometer major load developed where there's a central part, which is quartz and um, uh, grice and a mixture of um, mica, quartz, and topaz grading out through altered granite. And this part has actually been mined in the past. Here you can see some pictures of um, disseminated um, uh, mineralization. Um, associated with the microclinization of the felspars, just like you see in the thin sections in the third year lab of microclinization of the Bobby Ancock granite. And here you've got um, uh, cassiterite and um, uh, sphalerite. And again, going through to a next alteration process where you get uh, micro, sorry, um, gricinization and the development of new micas. These are actually green micas, um, they're not chlorite. And you can see um, uh, the disseminated alteration in these rocks as well. And that's the um, uh, a piece of cassiterite, which was the frontest piece of my thesis. And that was um, uh, taken from a chunk of cassiterite, which was tennis ball in size. So we've uh, gone through a series of alteration processes, microclinization and gricinization. And then what you often get at a late stage is big fat quartz veins um, with things like um, wolframite and cassiterite in them. And sometimes, as in the Bushveld complex, those veins can go out into the um, country rocks and here you can see a cassiterite tourmaline, a tourmaline vein um, from Royberg in South Africa, which is um, uh, cutting um, uh, felsite rocks. Now, you do get pegmatites um, uh, that have parent granite bodies, and you see that particularly well in the Kabaran of East Africa. So I'm jumping back. Um, uh, in time to um, a thousand million years ago. And all these symbols here um, in DRC, uh, Rwanda, um, Uganda, um, represent pegmatites. The light colored ones are tin bearing, the red ones are tungsten bearing, and the blue ones are tantalum bearing. And um, uh, these are related. Uh, these um, are related to post-compressional um, uh, granites called G4 granites, which occur in this um, uh, belt here. And um, they are 
uh, clusters of barren and rare metal pegmatites, tin tungsten uh, pegmatites, and here's two of our um, uh, former graduates, Richard Montjoy and Innes Berman, working on assessing the grade of some of these um, pegmatites uh, in that belt. And here's the um, cassiterite grains that they've um, got out of those pegmatites. So these are associated with um, a melt that has come from the um, uh, G4 granites. They do get alteration in the granites and a little bit of disseminated mineralization. It's too low grade to be mined anywhere. And um, uh, as they go out, these um, uh, further from the um, granites uh, parent, we um, get um, specialized um, uh, rare metal pegmatites and tin uh, uh, associated with them. And these most distal uh, pegmatites went, uh, under, um, uh, underwent a, a very intense albitization process. Now, what can also happen and has been um, uh, recorded at the, um, this BC um, project here is remobilization of the um, uh, cassiterite from uh, these sort of pegmatites and granites. And um, so it's a low temperature, hydrothermally um, remobilized um, uh, tin-rich uh, association. And we get um, veins and disseminations in uh, chlorite schist in this BC area. And it's just started um, uh, operating uh, or producing in the last month. It's run by um, uh, Pangea Resources uh, in association with another company, and it's owned um, and run by Anton Esterhazen and Helen Payne here in um, Johannesburg. And we bumped into um, Anton Esterhazen in a restaurant about a month ago, and he said, we're producing, we're producing. So um, what you get um, at this project is a very unusual um, uh, scenario where you've got a very steeply dipping um, zone here um, uh, with intense chloritization of micaceous schists. So you've got um, a carbonaceous shale, um, you've got metasediments, you've got a quartz sericite schist, and then this highly cl um, chloritized uh, zone here, which is very rich in tin. Now, it's very unusual tin because it's not the SNO2 of the very um, uh, typical cassiterite that we've been looking at a few moments ago. This is a low temperature uh, material called um, wood tin, and um, it's associated with other low temperature sulfides such as galena, uh, sphalerite, and little bits of uh, silver as well. Um, but it's a very respectable average tin grade of 3.5% um, tin, which is a very good grade. And these are pictures, I think I saw Thomas in the um, audience. These are pictures of um, Thomas Stapley that he looked at this deposit um, uh, for his honors project. Now, cassiterite is a very... Um, hard, tough um, material, and it doesn't weather to secondary products like copper minerals or silver minerals or whatever. And so um, if it's weathered out of the roof of a granite, and remember the um, Nigerian granites were emplaced at a very shallow level, and they've been unroofed, the volcanics have gone, and um, the cassiterite has been weathered out of those granites and it's been distributed into um, uh, rivers around um, the area. And so um, uh, cassiterite can be mined more profitably from these um, alluvial and eluvial deposits. Eluvial deposits are uh, those that are um, just sitting where the um, uh, original rock was. And then alluvial deposits is um, a material that's been transported by water uh, much further afield. 
And here you can see in Nigeria, um, uh, an area I, uh, that I worked on for my PhD, being mined. And um, generally, it's, they just use water cannons to get a slurry of material, which they then put down these um, chutes here, which have got sort of steps in them. And the uh, cassiterite, uh, because of its density of 7.5, gets trapped behind these stairs. And on a much smaller scale, um, these local uh, guys are mining um, uh, in small streams. And you can see that the guy here has made an artificial little waterfall, and the water's coming down and concentrating uh, the cassiterite um, as the current slows as it comes down the um, uh, little waterfall. Now, in economic geology, a deposit is only economic if somebody wants to buy it at a price that's greater than it costs you to produce it. And you might be aware at the moment that there's problems with the gold mines in um, South Africa, problems with the platinum mines, because in many cases it's costing more um, to get an ounce of gold out of the gold mines than people are actually paying for it. Fortunately, the price has gone back up and we're solvent again. But it's the same with whatever commodity you're talking about. And um, uh, when I was working in Nigeria, within the space of um, 18 months, the um, price of tin halved. And in, there was this major world collapse in tin price in 1985, partly because the International Tin Council flooded the market and there was an oversupply, so the price went down. But as you see from this Infamine um, uh, diagram here, the um, price of tin bounced along from about 1989 to about 2004 at something like two US dollars a pound. Now, co commodities, are pr some are priced in ounces, some are priced in pounds, some are priced in kilos, and some are priced in tons. And that's long tons and short tons. So it's a bit difficult sometimes to track the price. But essentially, a pound is about half a kilo. And you can see that in 2004, the price essentially went up and up and up and up. And it reached um, $14, whoops, $14 a pound um, uh, in um, 2008, and then has sort of fallen again. And um, this uh, dramatic um, uh, fall in price in 1985 was really responsible for a lot of the closure of tin mines in Africa. And so um, tin mining started to decrease in Nigeria. Um, several mines in Eastern Africa closed. Um, the um, uh, Zyplatz tin mine uh, closed, although it went on till the 1990s because people wouldn't sell South Africa tin during the apartheid era but even um, uh, the uh, Zyplatz tin mines succumbed to this dramatic drop in price. So um, uh, although we had been uh, a major producer in Africa um, uh, prior to this time of producing between about 5 and 10% of the world's tin, by 2013, um, it, we had dropped in Africa dramatically to producing less than 3% of the world's tin. And um, it was, it's um, being produced from DRC, Rwanda, Nigeria, um, Egypt. And um, the other problem is that so often a problem in Africa that smelters just closed because there wasn't enough tin to make them economic. And tin is a very heavy commodity. And um, uh, certainly from Nigeria, it got airlifted out to um, uh, uh, Europe and, and the UK. So that made um, uh, the tin production very expensive. However, there's kind of good news for um, Africa in that we've got this um, uh, BC um, uh, project. There's Ahmak in Morocco, which isn't um, pr um, producing. And there's renewed interest in a lot of the historical so sources, 
such as Kamativi um, pegmatites near uh, Vic Falls in Zimbabwe, and particularly at Uis in Namibia, which we are working closely with the geologists there because they're all Vitsis anyway. So um, uh, to just try and put that all together, I see that we can we have something of a unifying theme of um, the relationship between um, pegmatites, which are structurally controlled um, uh, of um, melt, small amounts of melt um, without a granite parent, um, uh, larger amounts of granite melt, um, uh, which might be mineralized in their roof zones or else um, uh, have associated veins which might be zoned or unzoned um, uh, uh, or pegmatitic or sheeted quartz veins which are um, mineralized in these exogranitic um, veins. So that's um, my model. Thank you very much. It's a small, um, we in, envisage it as um, a small granite body, essentially. There's just a small amount of granite melt. You it's still a part of the granite. It's part of the granite making the process. Yeah. Okay, yes. Um, they're, they're all part of the granite making process. But um, what we're seeing for these um, small degrees of partial melt is that we don't necessarily have to have a big blobby jobby somewhere down there that's the, the parent that, uh, that these are offshoots of. Because that's, that's the sort of the Dave London model, that if you get a pegmatite, there's a great big granite blob somewhere down there that you don't see, which is a very convenient way of hiding it away. Um, there's granite classifi uh, uh, pegmatite classification schemes which are horrendous in the extreme and are currently undergoing um, uh, revision because a lot of the modern workers don't like the old um, schemes. But essentially, you get um, LCT pegmatites, with, which are lithium, cesium, tantalum, and historically, they've been regarded as the ones that are likely to have tin in. And then you get NYF ones, which are regarded as not having tin, but they do in, in um, Nigeria. But those pegmatites are very small. So essentially, you're looking for the lithium cesium tantalum type. And many pegmatites, such as green bushes in Australia, um, which is one of the world's biggest um, uh, tantalite and lithium producers, have um, uh, been mined for tin in the past, and then it's been more recently mined for lithium, and that's the same with um, various. A number of pegmatites have been mined for tin, but they're being re-looked at now for their lithium content. I was looking for the, the process. The simple, the simple answer is, I'm not sure. The um, uh, easier answer is, it depends what you're melting and whether there's tin in your source, the tin tantalum in your source or not. It's, it's actually quite um, difficult to um, draw a graph. I've actually tried to do that for this talk. But um, uh, it varies from country to country. And the only um, country that produces very um, uh, simple statistics that I can understand is um, uh, the US. So that slightly skews the, the view. And also, they tend to report the tin that goes into tin in indium oxide as tin in alloys. And so you can't separate it from um, other um, alloys, such as um, uh, bronze. So it's something I'm trying to actually do at the moment. I don't know, Paul, do you, can you answer that? Just an expansion to that is that environmental 
environmental factors meant that having a high proportion of lead in solder was undesirable. And so solder has been increasing in its tin content for a number of years, driven by legislation. At the same time, we now have touch screens as well. So it's a little bit of a double whammy for tin. Um, but finding out the proportions of tin used in different end products is actually a bit of a nightmare. Right. I'm going to get a question. My comment relates to your very British understatement where you said that the BCA grade of 2.5% tin uh, is very good. Uh, in fact, it's probably the uh, best in the world. In yes, the world. yes. <laughs> Okay. Uh, Audience, uh, I should have told you apparently it's the best in the grade in the world. Uh, Consider myself chastised. Uh, so my question is Oh there's a question. Yes. Oh sorry. All oh, right. Is, what is the average grade of tin deposits around the world? About half a percent. Um, wheat is probably about point point three. three. Yeah. Is China again the same, the biggest importer, or which country is importing tin? Who is controlling the price? It's going to all the, the technological countries. Um, it's going, there's, uh, Japan is a major importer, um, uh, US, Western Europe, and in fact, um, uh, Germany are very concerned about where their tin is coming from and like several other elements like tantalum etc they are fingerprinting where the tin comes from so they don't buy any conflict tin as they call it um, but just uh, virtually all the technological countries and um, virtually nobody in the southern hemisphere apart from Australia yes one last question at the back I have no idea, Paul. Can you help me? I'll look into it. They don't know. Thank you. I have to give this talk somewhere else, so I need to find answers to the questions like that if I can. All right, Judith, thank you very much for giving that talk. I much appreciate it. Once again, thank you to CCIT Cole for the drinking tips, as well as the volunteers from the Honours Club for putting them out and looking after them. So thank you very much. <laughs> Next week's talk, unfortunately, the, the speaker has, has cancelled at short notice. We will find another talk. So if anyone has a talk waiting to be presented, Lynn, what about you? <laughs> I could do that. Sharon, perhaps. There will be a talk next week. We're not sure of the title. So come along anyway, and uh, we'll see you then. Thank you. <laughs>